All right. Hello, everyone. I guess we'll go ahead and get started. It's um, uh, five after. Uh, we are going to be recording this meeting. So. So yes, uh, just before we start, I wanted to make sure that you all are aware that there is going to be a Norwegian national um, warning system going off around anywhere from 11.55 to 12.10. Um, that will be going a uh, big siren outside and then also any phone that is associated with the Norwegian telecommunications. So if you would like, you can go ahead and uh, put your phone on airplane silence if, uh, if that's convenient for you. But we wanted to welcome everyone here today um, to join our session. Uh, this is, um, our session is on usability and design. Uh, but with our focus is why listening to users is important and how do we do more of it? Let's see. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, DHS2 has a foundation of working with users. The foundation is built upon participatory action, research, and design. Uh, this is a Scandinavian research approach uh, with that involves collaborative activities carried out between users, developers, stakeholders to enable system design, development, capacity strengthening, and system testing. And this is a picture of Lars in 2000 and team in, in Kenya in 2010 and really highlighting the core foundation of what DHS2 was built upon. Going into the field with as a developer, uh, going to different clinics, uh, finding out what users are wanting, then coming back to the hotel and coding at night, uh, getting from, based on the feedback they've gotten, and then putting it into production the next day. However, with the increase um, expansion of DHS2, we are not able to do that same process anymore. We're trying to be a little bit more professional, maybe using JIRA, maybe using uh, sprints, uh, maybe having a testing instance. So this is the way forward with DHS2 and design is being able to keep some of our core principles of working with users, but in a more sustainable manner to be able to scale our design practices. Over the last year and a half, uh, UIO, the University of Oslo has um, started having a dedicated part of the software team, in addition to the researchers, to make sure we stay close to the users. So maybe I can just have uh, the UIO design team stand up. Um, Caroline, Artie, Joe, and Marcos over here. So yes, uh, this is our uh, UIO design team and hopefully it will continue to grow as design and user experience is a high priority uh, to DHS2. But when I say design, um, many things come to your mind. Uh, I think this is the hardest part is when you say design, we sometimes talk, uh, we miss each other. We talk um, uh, past each other. So when, to an implementer, design might mean configuration in the software. How can you make your program uh, usable? How can you use the functionality in DHS2 to something that the users want? A health program manager, the word design might mean, I want my form uh, to look a certain way. I want the workflow of the design uh, to mimic the work process. To a national ministry of health, uh, design means indicators. How can we get those indicators in? And how do we make decisions based on that? To a developer, it means could be a uh, feature software uh, design. Um, this is this is kind of the ideal idea of what design is. I want this button here. 
However, you all know working with DHS2 on a generic platform, that might not be the role of design that you're capable to have. However, what you are capable is whatever design you are doing, whatever you call design, the source of the information that you need is found with the person that will be using whatever you have designed. So this is why it's so important to listen to users whenever we mention the word design in whatever form that means to you. Um, since we are designers and talking about users, let's begin with a Mentimeter. Let's hear from you all. So go ahead and scan this and we'll ask a few questions. So yeah, I'll let you give you guys a few minutes to get logged in and answer the question. Oh yeah, <laughs> taking off airplane mode. You have till almost twelve. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and change the Mentimeter if that's okay. Oops. Yeah. Okay, now I want you to ask her this question. <laughs> How do we get to this? Okay. Okay. Okay, this is nice. Look, in this room, we have quite a wide variety of DHS2 users. I like that we have, oh, we have an app developer. This is nice. You guys get to choose where the button goes and how it looks. Are you talking to your users to know where that button goes? Uh, we have engineer, director of design. Whoa, lots of designers. Uh, developer, solutions architect, product owner, product manager, research. Mm. Wow, yeah, manager, digital health specialist. Superstar, you all are superstars in my eyes. The herder of cats, that is actually a uh, difficult job. Okay, so as you can see, there's a wide variety in this room. You all come to the table looking at design from your own perspective and through a particular lens. However, with this session, what we want to talk about is giving you um, and your particular role another tool in your toolbox, another way to add dimension to your role, another way to start thinking about how to design with users in mind in whatever form design means to you. Okay, we'll go to the next Mentimeter. Next question. What apps do you think are easy to use? Google Maps. Uh, I don't think that. <laughs> Any app, if you have one in DHS2, feel free, but <laughs> but uh, general apps are also nice. Data entry, oh, okay, this is nice. Tinder, swipe right. <laughs> Google map, oh, Instagram, WhatsApp, Slack, Waz, I don't know what that is. What is it? Ruder, look at you Norwegians. Cash cleaner, all oh, good. Uber. Dashboards, oh, the Apple News, Trello. The camera app. 
so we were talking oh yeah we can talk about this but i'll mention it since while well, people are still kind of getting things in here i was talking with Artie the other day about um visual memory and your camera app yeah visual memory is basically you've used it enough and she can explain it if i miss uh misuse it but basically you have a visual memory of where a roundabout on your phone's uh app is so i know in your mind you can go right to this left hand corner and swipe and you know that that is where your camera app is and that is a uh, part of design show okay instagram is the big winner whatsapp google maps uber slack okay data entry joe should be happy about that okay what makes these apps easy to use good workflow and friendly design consistency good data flow simplicity intuitive good ui ux friendly use not over complicated clean i like that it's easy to find what you're trying to do they are simple i really like this so a uh, question to think about do you think based on the apps that you just mentioned and the responses that you got that this was done on first try or do you think that this was uh this apps and what you like from these apps was took an iterative process of talking with users of being able to uh, tweak something test it out so this is what it takes to make a good app you're not going to get it on day one so the next question is how do you in your implementations in your job with dhs2 make time to have this opportunity to do iterative design in whatever capacity you are is this something that you need to start talking to your um, ministry of health and talking about the importance of design and what it takes is this an opportunity to talk to the donors and say maybe we should have a deliverable line saying uh, listening to users is important because this is how you get to a good app last question why is it important to listen to users to drive adoption nice just keep making them just say keep using it keep using it to make sure we address their needs they understand a lot about what they need i love this it's uh we had a nice conversation with uh, one of our hisp users and they said uh we know our users we talk to them a lot however it's easy to start assuming also so as you need to go down and really talk with them even though you know them as your own personal user to know how you can satisfy their needs they know the workflow better than us ding 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 there's lots of workarounds that they make uh, for relevance ease, ensure you truly understand the needs and challenges the system is for them I like that the system is for them how do we make it so that they want to use it better use of system data i like that if they don't if you don't listen to users if they don't trust you if they don't understand what you've designed why would they are you going to get the correct data output that you want i think we have some more they're the ones that have to use your system yeah this is all great Users need to be comfortable to encourage them. I love this. I really liked the impact story, uh, the impact session yesterday. A couple of the presentations were focused on uh, this District of El Excellent concept. And I really liked how they were focused um, on going down to talking with the users, creating indicators um, that mattered at the district level instead of just pulling national level indicators um, and pushing those to the district. What they were doing was creating district level indicators that were meaningful uh, to that level. So I like how this is really, people are already doing this. But what we wanna focus on, oops, that was a surprise, just wait.
So our focus today is, of course, why listening to users is important. And we all know this is true. The hard part is, how do we do it better? How do we know how to um, get output from listening to users? It's nice to have a conversation, but do you all know how to make it um, some sort of output that can be pushed into development or pushed into um, conversations with the Ministry of Health? So I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to my colleague, Artie, and she will continue with the presentation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Aarti, and I work uh, in, DHS, in DHIS2 as a UX researcher. I've recently, somewhat recently, joined their team. Um, and uh, I think Kim did an excellent job of summarizing why the shift of our entire organization is slowly moving towards paying more attention to the user experience. Because um, when I joined the application, I I had a bit of a hard time myself, right? And I think some of us may echo with that opinion, but it's it's so, um, I, I found it also very nice that a lot of people over here were open to the idea of making this not just a functional app, because everybody here in the room knows that DHIS2 is probably the most used app in so many domains for collecting data, but um, taking it to the next level is kind of where we are moving towards now. And uh, it's gonna be an exciting journey and, um, let me just begin right now um, and kind of walk you through um, what the process of design looks like and what it could look like for anybody in the room, uh, regardless of what they do, whether they are a developer, whether they are a manager. Um, and for this example, let me let me say I'm an implementer, right? And I need to configure a program. Uh, so what are certain steps that I may want to take in order to get to my uh, ultimate goal of configuring this program? Right. Um, my first step would be probably to find the uh, the problem that needs to be solved. Right. Um, and um, as we go through this, some of this may resonate with you, and some of this may be new. So um, uh, feel free to like make a note of this, and we can have a discussion about this towards the end as well. Um, but finding the problem to be solved. Um, let's say I've figured out that uh, manual manual entry of uh, uh, data can be tedious, it can be time consuming. And so the problem that I'm trying to solve for is uh, reducing and, and working on the speed as well as uh, reducing the redundancy because uh, we know that when uh, data is being entered manually, there might be more chances of inaccuracy of data, right? So digitization could be one of the solutions for that. Um, and so my first step then would be to identify the problem that needs to be solved. Secondly, I would want to then start building more context around this problem, right? Um, trying to maybe figure out what exactly are the causes uh, or maybe understanding the environment in which this healthcare worker probably works, right? What kind of, dig uh, dig uh, what kind of devices are they using? Are they using Android apps? Are they using iPhones? Are they using tablets? Um, do they have internet connectivity? What are the kind of rooms they are working in? What time of the day would they probably be entering this data into the apps, right? So these are all things which help me in my next step, which basically is to uh, design the solution uh, for this problem, right? Um, we'll spend some more time over here as we go ahead, but uh, designing the solution could be in the form of maybe considering that I need to build a new form, which is easy to use, um, perhaps does not have as many um, you know, uh, entries, not enough uh, data fields so that people can do this quickly. Because uh, at every point of this journey, I need to kind of keep coming back to the first thing. What is the problem that we are trying to solve for? If we are trying to solve for speed, then I need to ensure that the design that I have created does that. It makes it easier for people to use it. And it's not, um, it does, so that tech does not kind of get into the way of the user, rather it supports them, right? And And this can happen very, um very often um uh, and it's a very difficult problem to be solving for because it's a complex one as well um which is why the next step is extremely helpful which is testing the solution right and let me just pause here and kind of ask all of you if actually you know what you can maybe close your eyes because i don't want you to get worried about what you are saying and what others are saying so take a minute close your eyes and with the show of hands, tell me 
whether you think you are a user centered designer as how we have discussed what design means do you think you are, you, you are you user centered yeah any <laughs> okay so i i see the response and that's great um keep your eyes closed again of the people who said that they are user centered did you speak to a user in the last 3 months okay all right great so i see that there are there's a mixed group here right there's a mixed group of uh, people who are well aware that uh, they might be user centered and make an effort to continue speaking with users uh there are also people who are aware that they may not have that sort of um uh, user centered sort of an approach so i think this session should be good to maybe help you get started and for people who have been doing this that's great that's amazing and you should be doing more of this right um i think my role over here right now is um uh, kind of help you understand that this honestly isn't really ro rocket science right like listening to users shouldn't be as difficult as we may anticipate it to be but it's a skill right and uh, in order to learn that skill and in order to be able to perfect that skill we need to do more of it right so if you haven't been doing it already i would then urge you to do more of it and i'll tell you more about why uh, and if you've already been doing it then i'd urge you to do more of it uh, and again i'll tell you why <laughs> right uh, we'll move on uh, but as you know um, yeah the ceo of land rover uh, had something very interesting to say uh, if you think good design is expensive you should look at the cost of bad design uh, this one resonates really well with me uh, because a lot of times uh, this becomes lesser of a priority good design becomes lesser of a priority because it gives us the data that we want but does it really that's again something that we would be looking at yeah. all right coming back to this we are going to focus mostly on designing a solution and then testing the solution right because this is where the loop of design happens and um, while it might be difficult to be able to continue doing the testing and uh, uh, designing again and again even once your program or your implementation is out and it's released um, let me try and convince you all right um so let's look at several venn diagrams right so let's see what we think users want and what users actually want right this would be a great strong overlap where what we are designing and what they are using have more or less um, an entire overlap right like there are some things that uh, they may want more of and then it's it's kind of like a back and forth um, but this is kind of what we want this is what we want that the overlap is strong but a lot of times what ends up happening is that what we think the users want is a very small section and what what the, uh, what the uh, what the users actually want might be uh, something more uh, but what's kind of interesting over here is that this could also happen right what we think the users want is maybe a b c d e but what they are looking for is a very simple solution right um, and then this may also happen right where we are like worlds apart right and what happens when you know um 2 3 and 4 happen i think think of it like a domino effect right the first thing that it begins with our poor assumptions being made right so when we are not entirely certain about when there's a disconnect between what we think the users want and what they actually want what ends up happening is that poor assumptions are made and so poor questions are asked and so we now we have poor answers and then poor decisions are made poor actions are taken and eventually you're ca you're collecting poor data which is not what we want right so this would be probably the first reason why you should be listening to users more is to kind of avoid that disconnect between what users think uh, uh what we think the users want and what users actually want <laughs> how many of you are able to relate to this photo show of hands maybe okay <laughs> all right that was also me uh yeah can you give us some examples of when you have felt like this and it doesn't have to be related to dhis too but <laughs> <laughs> 
maybe. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone want to want? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's really annoying. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have four iSight in the Gmail app on my phone. Yeah. It will only show like one line of the preview text. Yeah. So, and I have to use a different app. I that four that I use. Oh, accessibility. Yeah. Yeah. My parents how to use technology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I struggle with that every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think this kind of uh, um, contributes again to the kind of work that we are doing, right? Frustration can be a very uh, big problem and often an underrated problem, right? Because uh, users are not kind of in our close vicinity. But when people are frustrated or confused or just annoyed, a lot of repercussions could be uh, happening, right? And let me just walk you through some of these. Slow uptake of the app, right? Uh, people may not want to use it as it is intended to be used. A lot of data inaccuracy can happen, right? Um, yeah, uh, maybe let's just stop there and think about that one because data is extremely important. That's the, uh, that's what DHIS2 is essentially trying to collect. But when somebody is frustrated and is expected to enter let's say 25 fields because they have been told to do so people find ways around it right uh, they may enter false data they may enter zeros they may find their way around it right and of course we have like ways to validate our data as well but falsification does happen right uh, we can't like look around that and and that's something that can be avoided if they are listened to in the first place and also if uh, we are able to create design which is user friendly. Um, yeah, sharing poor reviews with your fellow colleagues. And what that essentially does is that uh, there is a sense of mistrust uh, created around the application, which ends up making them uh, hesitate to, in order to use it another time, right? So giving something another shot. Um, I've faced this uh, many times, right? Where I'm not a big fan of, let's say, uh, Microsoft Teams, and that's because my first uh, uh, time of having used it was terrible. And so I've never had um, the courage to kind of go back. Um, yeah, and also the second last point, I think that's an important one, bare minimum usage, right? They do just enough uh, what is expected of them. And what that stops them from doing is exploring more. So let's say if we are pushing features which might be amazing and which might really help them uh, do their job better. But since, uh, is that the, okay, <laughs> okay, just to be sure. Yeah, so they find other ways of doing work and, um, and they don't end up exploring as we may want them to and to no fault of theirs, right? Right, so in order to create designs which are effective, efficient and easily understandable, listening to users becomes a very, very important part, right? Because if you are trying to create intuitive design, uh, they need to be able to use it as intended. They need to be able to use the product quickly and efficiently, and they need to be able to understand what's written on the screen. And I think a lot of us end up facing this challenge and uh, uh, DHIS2 is actually a very unique product because we are doing half the design and also the implementers are doing the other half of the design. So it's a very uh, great back and forth between the design team here as well as them. But I think it, therefore it becomes even more important for all of us to be able to value the importance of design and the users on the field. So here's uh, my attempt at making, a, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are all the complex problems that DHIS2 users are working for, right? These are the big lofty goals that we are all eventually trying to go towards, right? Improving access to education, right? Making policy level decisions, right? Making, um, uh, you know, being able to control an outbreak, COVID, all of that, right? And these are very, very big, difficult, nasty problems that all of us are trying to work towards, right? And um, and getting people aligned on these goals already is a mammoth task for all of us. And training is one of the ways we do it, right? Getting people um, aligned on a problem together. But then a lot of times what happens is that when design is not intuitive, a lot of our focus then ends up 
going towards how do you click a button? What would be your first step and second step and third step? And this kind of takes away from the, um, the very valuable time that trainers have, which could be then used to train them towards these uh, uh, large complex problems that they would like to resolve for. Right. So the final, I, I, and I, I'll just leave you with this one for now, but intuitive design basically helps reduce training efforts. And this is something um, I know that we all wish we can reduce. And I think that it is possible. Um, it takes a bit of time and it takes a little bit of training to be able to create designs which are intuitive, but it's definitely an achievable goal, um, in my opinion. So this is something we saw previously, right? Um, and um, if I were to broadly kind of divide how design works or the process of design works, we can maybe split it into two where you have ideation and then you have release, right? So you're thinking of like, what are the problems to be solved, designing and all of that. And then um, testing kind of is uh, a part of ideation and a part of release as well. And then you have developing. And there are lots of tools that you can be using to be listening to users more, right? And some of these may just be uh, words to some of us, right? Uh, they may not make too much of sense. So I would suggest that you don't look at this as, you know, what exactly do, do you mean when you say like uh, usability bug reviews or like, I don't know, task analysis and all of that, but, or competitor analysis. I think what's more important is to kind of see what the kind of variety that we have to be able to listen to users. And quite simply, if you're just speaking to them more, that would be the first step to like start building that communication so that uh, we are um, we are understanding their problems a little bit better. So today, let's look at these two um, methods of uh, speaking to users, listening to users. Um, and user interviews is a very easy way to be able to do that. Uh, usability testing, and I'll speak a little bit more about this because I'm not sure if all of us uh, over here may uh, truly understand, but uh, long story short, what we are trying to do in usability tests is to observe more than ask questions, right? So if we have an idea, and this idea could be half-baked, it could be a full functioning prototype or a design that's already out and released. But we want to kind of try and see how they take uh, these tasks that we give them and how do they kind of complete this task? And this can be done remotely. It can be done in person. Uh, it can be done, uh, uh, you know, like sitting in a lab. It can be done in a field. It's a very flexible sort of a technique which is out there. And I'm going to try and show you what we did very recently when we were at Sri Lanka. Uh, and we worked in collaboration with the HISP team at Sri Lanka. And we were able to kind of um, make a progress um, on the Android team. Uh, and Let's kind of look at that. So these screens might be familiar to some of you. And even if it's not, that's totally fine. But this is kind of what the Android app looked like uh, previously and uh, continues some of them to date, right? Still looks like that. Yeah, nothing has changed yet, right? But these are some work in progress ideas and explorations that we have been doing. and. Um, you can see that there are subtle changes here and there, right? Uh, most of it seems more or less the same, but then uh, making these subtle changes to this whole uh, app is what uh, the team at Android, the design team uh, with partners has been doing. This uh, is the TEI dashboard, which is slowly shaping up to look somewhat different, right? And uh, I want to keep uh, you know, stressing on the fact that these are work in progress. And uh, because one of the takeaways that I hope you have is that it's not a one-time job, right? We have to keep going back, testing it again and again to be able to make sure that people really truly understand what this is. What exactly does it mean to have an event stage, right? Uh, is it clear that the top half of this is static information? Is it clear that these blue but uh, the blue circles over there are in fact buttons, right? Are they able to understand what or necessarily not not understand but also maybe guess what they might find in the family tab or the graphs tab right at the bottom so when we were at sri lanka we were basically testing for these four different um, um, indicators i suppose right so learnability can the design that we have created uh, can it be learned easily is it discoverable 
right? Are things discoverable? Do they know where they will be able to find uh, a button that they are looking for? Will they, will they know how to be able to refer a particular patient without being trained to do so? Can this be made more intuitive? Um, are things comprehensible? Um, and this is, again, something which was very interesting for us to test for because a lot of times um, users of DHIS2 may not be English speakers, right? So the language that we're using becomes extremely, extremely important. Um, and finally, memorability, right? If, if people are given a particular training and then they don't use the app for, let's say, three or four months, if they start using it again, will they remember what they had learned in the first place? So let me just actually walk you through what a usability test session looks like. So if I were sitting for um, a usability test session for like about 45 minutes with a participant, I would first start priming them, letting them know that, you know, this is going to be a session. I'm, I'm going to basically tell them that we are not testing them. We are simply testing the application, right? These are certain things that you have to do in order to be able to make them feel comfortable. Um, and once the tasks begin, we also let them know that um, once they are able to share their honest feedback, it's only going to go back into the loop. It's very important to be able to create that sort of a comfort with them. Um, and I know that a lot of people over here have been doing, a, uh, you know, like building that sort of a rapport with users. Um, the What also ends up happening, and this is like purely out of experience, is when I have gone to fields with, um, very important people, right? Uh, doctors, and and you see that the um, you see how people change their uh, personas. They may always want to present their best work to you, um, and I mean, I would have done that too if I was in their position, right? Uh, but we want to meet them where they are, right? And so it's very important to remind them constantly, again and again, that this is for their benefit as well as ours, right? And it's very uh, nice to be able to create that sort of a uh, mentor apprentice sort of a relationship with them where they understand that they are the exp uh, they, they are the experts and not us uh, and the minute you're able to achieve that uh, it becomes a far easier process to be able to get honest feedback and not what I want to hear right um, so um, while I'm speaking with them, I may give them a situation, right? So maybe I might say that, you know, there's there's a woman who has come here and she has a child and you want to be able to find this child on the app again. Um, and so just something I want to point out here is that I said that you want to find the child. I didn't use the word search, even though I'm search, I'm, that's the thing that I'm testing for. Um, it's, it's interesting how quickly people are able to grab onto what you're saying and then try to find exactly that. This happened to me yesterday when I was creating some of these slides and I've somebody was like, I think you should hide the slide. And while I was looking for options, I was like, how do I do this? Where's hide? And I couldn't find it at all anywhere. And then I realized that there's another word that they're using, but my focus was so much on finding the word hide. Um, so it's, it's uh, just a personal experience, but I think some of you may have experienced this yourself as well, right? So um, yeah, I think, Creating these visualizations and making it sound more realistic is one of the ways I do it. And uh, there might be other ways as well, but this has helped me. Um, this has become a bit of a joke, <laughs> but uh, being able to ask questions back, especially when they are not sure about what to do. So a lot of times people will stumble when you give them tasks to do, especially if they're difficult tasks. So if I've asked them to find somebody, and if this is my first interaction with them, they may take forever and then they are getting scared and they are think, thinking that, you know, we are testing them or, um, and so they ask us back, how am I supposed to do this? Is this right? But the true value of usability testing is to be able to see how they stumble, right? We want to, and, and as uncomfortable as that might make you feel, uh, it's very useful to be able to take a step back and just allow them to go through those mistakes because those mistakes are, uh, is what is going to help uh, feed back into the design and then we will know exactly where they were stumbling. Um, yeah. A good um, example of this and a, a small tip over here would be to ask them the question. So if somebody asks me, um, how do you do this? Uh, so you just go back and ask them, what, how would you do this? Or what do you think about this? Right? Just reverse it back to them. Um, avoid over explaining the design. Um, this is a tendency that, especially if there are designers on the field, may want to do. And 
and these designers i'm using the word very broadly here if you're an implementer you may want them to understand what you have created before you start testing them right uh, i think a lot of us are guilty of having done that i i have been as well right and so when you give you when you hand over this additional information to them uh, you're kind of trying you're unfortunately taking away from the beauty of usability design which is uh, that it helps you find all these mistakes that have been made but if you are helping them understand the design you will never be able to kind of discover this for yourself asking open ended questions uh, i think this is another thing that um is so easy to mess up it's so easy um and so for example if i were to ask you if you enjoy shopping if i was let's say testing for amazon or flipkart right i have already made the assumption that you like shopping right uh, however what i should be asking is maybe taking a step back and asking you if you do like shopping to begin with um, a very uh, common one that um, i've seen people do and have done it myself is also uh, asking uh, if they like what we have created right uh, i mean you're not really giving them much of an <laughs> opportunity to say no there um so instead asking them what their opinion is instead of you know it's 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 a matter of rephrasing these are very small things and like i said in, initially this is not rocket science it's it's a skill that you can just pick up and uh, and can be done by a lot of people more than you would think so this was at as at sri lanka we uh, spoke to a lot of uh, uh, primary health midwives we spoke to nurses we spoke to uh, people who were working in uh, public health facilities uh, we were also observing how this session happens and uh, here you have carolina and marcus who were sitting in a different room and they were be, they were able to kind of see whatever the user is doing and make really useful notes for us so that we can then relay it back to our team these are just two examples of maybe let's let's focus on search and then i'll show you what happened when we were trying to test filters right so we noticed that search was actually working pretty well the new design that we had created was working pretty well um, and as you can see like 13 out of 14 people were able to discover this button but we also noticed that when they would come to this screen uh, there was a lot of confusion here right and uh, the reason was that they thought that this is the tei dashboard especially people who were not who have not used this previously they thought that this is the final screen that they have to be working on and this was only because we were not able to make that look clickable right and so they didn't re they didn't realize that this could this is this is just an intermediary step right so they need to click over here in order to be able to go to the next screen anyway so this was a very big learning and we are trying to work on how um, the results of search can be shown in a manner such that even if they don't have training they are able to go ahead and uh, enter data where it needs to be entered um we also noticed actually because uh, i just realized that um i didn't share another thing what what would happen here instead is that if the task was to add a new event to a particular patient what they may end up doing is clicking on this especially non english speakers right so even though we thought that this was very clear it says enroll new patient how can this be missed but when they see this button they think that this is going to help them go to the next step so they would click here and then add what they think but in effect what they are doing is that they are creating duplicate patients so this was a very useful um uh insight that we had uh towards the end of the uh, rounds of testing yeah uh sorry sorry so when there were i mean if you were to look at results there are three types of results right there might be zero search results there might be a single search results like this and there might be multiple search which is more or less like a list we noticed then when there were multiple uh, results on this screen there was no issue absolutely right because this is a familiar thing that they have seen uh, already in dhis2 in other applications as well it was very evident what they needed to do when there were zero search results as well but when it was one search result was when the problem was more right so uh, now we have to we have to go back to our drawing boards and see how we can make this one a little bit better right um filters and sort right um uh, a feature that we think can be extremely useful um but is it really used um is what we were trying to kind of figure out right 
so here on the right side is what you see. Uh, this is the final result uh, that we have kind of drilled down upon. And I think it's working very well. But initially, what was happening is that on this screen, they were not able to find the filters chip. And we thought that it was pretty uh, simple, because you see these chips outside, which say starred patients with high BP. That's exactly what the filters look like right ahead. And we thought this is upfront, and people might be able to click it, but it didn't work as intended. And the reason why they were not able to click it is because they didn't understand it to begin with. Right? Uh, the same thing happened with sort. We had sort as one of the options over there. And the, the first point of interaction, which is to be able to understand what you're looking at, was not there. And we realized that this is going to be a problem across, right? Like either you're, either you're in Sri Lanka or you're in India or you're in Bangladesh, a lot of countries are not going to be having uh, English speakers. And, and if this hasn't been translated, this is going to be an issue. So one way to be able to get them onto the screen is to push them into discovering it, which means that the final button that you now see is has been made blue. It looks slightly different from every other chip. And when we made it like this, people were clicking on it far more than we expected them to. Right? Another thing that we did over here is that the sort button initially was on top. But then we pushed it closer to the list so that they're able to associate that sorting is related to uh, the uh, list that they see right at the bottom. And filters is a feature which is different from this altogether. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Daniel Burka, who's sitting right here, once told me that a poorly performing design, and especially when you're um, iterating, this may feel like a very uh, bad thing, right? Like it's 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 easy to kind of fall into that trap of you know having created something and really really wanting it to work, and when it doesn't work, it 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 feels terrible, but. But it's also great that you're able to realize that early on in the process so that you make the changes right then. And, and therefore, it can then turn into a very, very useful, powerful thing to be able to do right in the beginning than, than having done this. And then this kind of reminds me back of uh, uh, the Land Rover uh, quote that we saw in the beginning. Right? Uh, changes can be expensive. So uh, it's good to be able to find these failures early on instead of having to like change them later. So once we were done with this testing at uh, Sri Lanka, um, we were kind of able to create results which looked something like this. right? So here you can see at the end, we, we, we did several rounds of testing. So here at the end of round one, you can see that, for example, search results didn't test as we expected it to. right? Inputting values for enrolling was a little difficult for users to be able to do. This, uh, filters and sort were not. Um, being able to, uh, they were not discovered basically by users. But over time, as we were making these iterations, um, we saw that uh, it, it became from a red to a yellow. And the hope is that the yellow becomes a green. So we are then confident enough to be able to ship it for production. Right. So, and, and this is again an, a very useful um, um, sheet. Uh, and the reason I'm showing you some of this is also because later on, like if you are, uh, stopping by at the expert lounge, and if you're interested, these are certain templates that we can also hand over to you. And you can start doing this by yourself as well, right? So these kind of matrix matrices help you know decide and, and kind of prioritize work. What are certain things that we should be taking up for design? And without wanting to become too technical, uh, yeah, I think priority is the key thing over here, and it helps you prioritize what are certain things that you should focus on. Uh, because time is of essence, and a lot of people don't have enough to, time to do uh, as much testing. Um, one of the most uh, useful things, I think, when we were at Sri Lanka for us was that we had a very strong buy-in from the Ministry of Health uh, and the Family and Health Bureau over there, as well as the his team. And, and that becomes very critical for anybody, right? It, it helps you get access to participants. It helps you uh, not have to worry about like the logistics of things because they're there with you. And also seeing the entire process kind of take shape. Uh, so that's Pramod. Uh, he is also here with us right now. And uh, Pramod became a very integral part to our whole session because 
he was essentially our translator during all of these sessions right and uh, uh, i mean he was amazing at his job uh, which is outside of translation but even as a translator there are lots of things that one must keep in mind and uh, he was able to kind of really take a neutral approach and not uh, you know push his agenda through the users to us instead be able to take a step back and really see what we were trying to do so um, maybe i i'd like to invite him on stage and just see if he can share some experiences if you'd like okay not putting him on the spot yeah yeah Right, thank you so much. So um, let me start by saying uh, it was a great field trip. So wh wh why I would uh, say so was like, there are a few reasons. So firstly, like uh, most of us, like who have been implementing DHIS2 in health, uh, mind you now we are uh, implementing DHIS2 in education and so many other different sectors. Like health, if we have implemented DHIS2 for like 10 years, and we have talked to these uh, different types of users for so many years, uh, when we talk to them, even when we want to implement DHS in a new program, we kind of understand like what they say. And and um, without even thinking, we kind of uh, tend to assume their requirements. But when it comes to requirements identification, this is kind of true, mainly because uh, the health uh, data workflows and the information uh, collection process, that doesn't change much. But the thing is, when it comes to design, it's not the same. Like some of us, just by looking at the DHS2, we know like which version of DHS2 this is. It's not just us, like even the users, because we keep on upgrading the instances and the users, they tend to kind of uh, go uh, through this journey of different versions. But the thing that we don't really do is like, we don't really get their feedback uh, on like, what do you feel about this new interfaces? Like, what do you feel about this? So like, while I was with this team, uh, joining as the translation translator, which I consider as a privilege, I will mention why, uh, I kind of uh, tend to realize like things are a bit different, which I did not uh, uh, kind of, uh, I mean, I did not understand it. Or I didn't see it that way before. And also the process, like, uh, as you mentioned before, like the placement of uh, each, each of us in the room and in different rooms. And as Arti mentioned, like, uh, yeah, two of us were joining uh, for the interview, but like, it was more about observing. Like, so we had three people simultaneously observing each click each movement of finger, like all, all these things. Uh, I mean, it was it was a major task and how to do this process, uh, uh, like interviewing for like more than one hour, uh, one user, like it was, a, it was a great experience, even that. And finally, the uh, self-reflection, like you mentioned, I was a translator. It was a very difficult role to start with because I, I mean, even though I was not involved with this particular implementation, this was a, a Ministry of Health implementation and we did not actually customize uh, the DHS2 for this. I mean, me uh, working as an implementer and now trying to act the role of a translator, it was very difficult initially, like, uh, I mean, like, like when, when, a, when a user is struggling and, I, and things are very obvious to me, I mean, and I'm doing the translation, uh, translation, I was kind of tempted to help the user, but yeah, it, it was difficult. But like, that's the thing, like when you work with the team or for a period of almost two weeks, uh, that's how you kind of uh, get used to and then we understand the team dynamics. So it was a really good experience. It was an agile experience. All these uh, team meetings and debriefings we had uh, in the night to kind of prepare for the next uh, week. So it was overall a really good experience. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I was just saying that I'm gonna let Carolina take over and the, this was the first section uh, where I focused mostly on, you know, making a case for why you should be doing this in the first place. And Carolina is gonna like help us see how we can be doing more of it. Yes. So yeah. Thank you. Okay, so you can hopefully hear me. Okay, so once again, we're gonna go into Mentimeter and we really want this session, we kind of had two uh, purposes for the session. We really wanted to tell you all kind of what we've been doing, uh, our work and experience so far. But then the other purpose was really to hear from, from you, both hear from you in terms of your experience, in terms of your needs and what maybe you would like to work on us with. So we can go into the into the menti because i think the the 
the link will also be there. I can hopefully just move on from this one. Let's see. Yes, great. Yeah, first we just want to hear from, from all of you in this room. Uh, in addition to RT's uh, close your eyes and raise your hand, we wanted to just get some numbers on how often you feel like you engage with end users when you're designing or, or implementing your DHIS2 solutions. So we see some are doing it more than once a month and that's really exciting to hear and we would love to hear more, more from you for sure. So just in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on to the next question, but we see also there's some potential here and that's also what we will get more into and how we're feeling that there's uh, a lot of, so much potential and so much insight to gain, even with just a small uh, couple of uh, user um, testing sessions or user research uh, approaches. So we'd really like to hear from you. You saw some techniques uh, that Artie, oh, sorry, was mentioning earlier. Um, so we just wanted to hear from you as well, what kind of techniques you've used. And we decided to keep it open-ended, you know, so you uh, weren't uh, swayed by the, the ones we had earlier, but I mean, if you remember them, that's, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, lots of different uh, good ones there. User interviews, user stories. We would say that uh, us as a design team uh, have really focused um, until now on a few of the first steps in the ideation process. We've really worked on gathering requirements, uh, hearing, uh, collecting user stories, really building context and understanding the problem. And now we want to also continue more into the later parts of designing and, and testing and iterating on the, on the usability of the solutions. Yeah, there's a lot of great uh, options here. Seems like some have been using or been doing usability testing again. Would love to hear from anyone who has been doing these different things. It's a lot of a uh, lot of interesting techniques here, but it seems like inter interviews is a is a is a good and and you know maybe low barrier uh, approach here. Okay, and then like I said. We would really like to hear from you whether there's any resources or any support or any help from the design team at UIO, at DHS2, that would be helpful for you if you were conducting user research, if you wanted to gather user feedback, if you wanted to do usability tests. So um, we will go into some of the things we're thinking of, of uh, helping with, but would also really like to hear if there are some other suggestions that we have not thought of. So yeah, seems like, you know, templates, guidelines, just being, uh, getting some help with how to start, you know, you don't have to start from scratch. There's lots of great uh, templates and, and starting points out there that even we are using and then, you know, adapting more to, to the DHIS2 context, so. This is great. We will, of course, you know, go through these answers later and, and really um, use that to help us guide our, our future work. So, looks good. All right, so now to lead into the next session, what do you anticipate would be your main cha challenge if you were to conduct usability tests. We can say also user research in general, but again, we've been focusing a lot on our usability test work and, and what we've done so far there. So yeah, language, again, we saw that in, in Sri Lanka, but we luckily had Pamud as an amazing translator, access to users, uh, avoiding bias, like the leading questions we were talking about, time, time is always <laughs> uh, an issue, you know, with Maybe you have a very short term project and you kind of need to get it going, get it set up uh, as soon as possible. So yeah, these are these are great. Yeah, as you see, time cost, language, a lot of a lot of the similar things. I think, yeah, we are on terms of time. I will then go back. And Spoiler, there's always gonna be a barrier. <laughs> so then we want to talk to you about how we can 
figure out some ways to reduce these barriers so you can get the kind of user feedback that you would like. So let's start with number one. We saw that a lot of people were mentioning budget costs and so on. So what if you don't have enough budget? Here are some suggestions we have, but we would also love to hear from you if you have anything. Um, you know, you can you can throw it out. But uh, one thing you can do is test remotely. You know, recruiting and visiting users are one of the biggest um, costs here. So you could, if you're possible from where you are, you know, get on a Zoom call with a user. You saw how in Sri Lanka, some of us were on the Zoom call and we were able to hear what the user was uh, talking through and see where the user was testing. Uh, you can also consider a kind of a testing approach called guerrilla testing, which is actually what Artie did a, a couple of rounds of in India before we went to Sri Lanka. So she uh, found some, not DHS2 users, but users of similar, you know, work background, uh, healthcare workers, pharmacists, and so on, and did a lighter weight uh, test with them. And those iterations we then built into the prototype. So we already had a few, you know, smaller rounds of testing before we went to Sri Lanka. And then if you could recruit from a known pool of participants, for example, you know, if you start doing usability testing, hopefully you, you kind of um, collect a pool of people that you can uh, reach out to. There's also some places where you, there's even like recruiting agencies for these type of tests. So let's go to the next one. What if I don't have access to the actual users, which we also saw some people mentioned so again, the kind of back to the guerrilla testing, like you can test with similar user profiles um, that you might have in, in closer access to you. And then, you know, we love our community. Maybe there's a way you can reach out to the larger community. Maybe someone has, again, uh, more access to end users that they can help you, um, help you reach out to, you know, any, we would say, uh, as we said in the test, um in sri lanka you know they are we kind of said it that you are helping you know make a, a software that's used in more than 70 maybe now almost 100 you know countries uh so you know you're com com contributing to something uh really impactful and greater than yourself and so hopefully we can also uh you know build on that in in the community and here's the, what if I don't have the technical capacity? This is the place that we hopefully can work together and help you more with. So first of all, I mean, the ideal would be you can hire a UX researcher in your organization that can help you with this. We luckily, <laughs> you know, have RT now as a UX researcher, which is super nice. But again, that goes into the budget part uh, as well. Uh, but you could look into building capacity within your organization, have some seminars, have some workshops, and in general, build that capacity among your staff. And then, you know, reach out to us to see if we can work together, because this is where we're hoping we can help reduce the barrier. This is where we ho hope we can contribute with, with resources and with capacity building um, and, and guidelines and templates and, and so on. What if you don't have enough time? That was, again, also one that came up. Um, we would say that, you know, don't do too much at once. Like test, do smaller tests, test rapidly and be be flexible. Um, you know, rely on templates because you don't have to create everything from scratch and then prioritize. Maybe think of the areas where you're like, this is the area I'm least confident about. This is the, and I would like to know more or the area where like, this would probably make the most impact if it's really efficient, effective, easy, easy to use. So you kind of reduce the scope a bit in that way. So what more, just a couple of more sections about some advice for, for uh, usability testing, but also user feedback generally. So try to build, again, a regular cadence of conducting user research and usability testing, not um, kind of have smaller tests. You can, don't do just like one huge test like or, or user feedback session once a year. Try to do it, again, dependent on budget and time constraints, but try to do smaller ones uh, throughout the year. You know, it helps with, iterative uh, processes that we really like here at DHS2 instead of an all out effort. Also, if you lessen the scope that you're testing each, each time, 
you'll probably get deeper insight for that particular uh, part of the scope. Um, we also suggest that you, of course, share the progress with the stakeholders because to really show the impact of the process that you're doing, you know, that will uh, both motivate the stakeholders to probably, you know, let you or let you do more of it, you know, like, again, increase access to users, you know, maybe increase budgets and so on. And it's also motivated to the users that they see, you know, again, they're contributing to a, a bigger thing. They're seeing kind of what their feedback did and, and proof of like a positive change to that. And then of course, what we want to do here in this room and in the conference in general, we want to, and the community in general, we want to co collaborate and learn from each other. So, you know, collaborate with, you know, his groups, NGOs, other implementation partners, donors, whoever's in the field. You know, if you have experiences, we would love for you to share it in the community of practice and we'll try and think of some more avenues in the community of practice that we will uh, reach out more. And then I think we should just need to lower the barrier to feedback. I think almost any insight could be useful, you know, like any any insight can can uh, help us, you know, make DHS2 more useful. So let's talk a little bit about what we're doing next. Um, again, we want to, we're going to look back at what you all wanted in the Mentimeter, and that will also uh, inform our decisions for this. But we really do want to develop guidelines and conduct webinars to talk even more in detail about how you can do usability testing and also other parts of the uh, design process. And then we want to take our own advice. We are not, we are not, you know, doing this kind of regular cadence for usability testing for all our products. We're doing quite a lot with, with Android now. We had a really good uh, post-release uh, test of the line listing app in Rwanda. But other than that, we, we also need to take our own advice and, and establish this routine. And we also want to scale. We want to, uh, again, going back to the purpose of the session, we want to help you do the same. We want to scale with our HIS groups so we can get even more user feedback. But we also need to scale how we do take action on that, on that feedback. And uh, then, of course, we have the expert launch later today at five, I think. And feel free to come and talk to us about, share your experiences about usability testing, and uh, come and ask or like uh, how to get started with usability testing and all this. And then we have our very simple design at DHS2 email. If you have any questions, if you want to reach out or get updates on anything else we're, we're up to. So I think then we're at the question part. <laughs> And how are we doing with time before the alarm goes off? <laughs> and before we open the questions, um, I have asked Enzo to share an experience. <laughs> I remember how I asked you, Enzo? <laughs> okay, tell us. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, so we were talking with Enzo in the hall and he gave a very, I'll remind you what it is. You gave us a very <laughs> nice use case of an implementation that you were writing a contract for, a little extra money, but not enough to be piloting. So you decided to test. Yeah, okay, so you took, yeah, the, we, yeah, okay. We we did have, we, the, there was, at some point we had uh, a, a contract where we were going to, we were not going to do any initial visit, but we decided to, to actually do that, to have some direct interaction, uh, interaction with the users at first. So we, we essentially, with Stefano, we went for a very quick and dirty prototype first so that we could test it with the users. Is that what we're talking about? Okay, good. <laughs> so the, the first meetings were going to be just for design, where we we're going to decide what the design was going to be. But instead, whilst we were getting ready to go on that trip, we just made a prototype with what we thought made sense. And turns out it didn't. Uh, uh, and, and that was very useful to get very quickly out of the way, right? A lot of our assumptions that we had that were also verified by the partner we were talking to and we were making them were wrong, simply. The, it was not what the users were going to be doing. Uh, we were thinking like a lot of, if I'm to make it more contextual, like a lot of the interaction with the clients was going to be happening in the streets when we didn't even consider that aspect of that. 
uh, the order in which things were going to be done was not what we envisioned. So that initial interaction with the users was really valuable. If we had waited until the end to do all this, it would have been a lot of wasted time and effort. So like, you know, failing early it me is failing cheap, essentially. And that's something we should focus on, I guess. Thank you, Enzo. So I appreciate you sharing that on the spot. So you were given <laughs> all the papers. You were given the reports. You were given the paper forms. You were given the information from the Ministry of Health. So you, basically, you were basically taking that information that you had and making some assumptions early on uh, based on what you had. But by going to the users, you saw a different picture and were able to make a quick uh, change. And you were not doing um, developing. This was configuration of a, uh, of a program. So it's how do the data elements work? How do you ask questions? Yes, please. Thank you so much for your presentation. Please. Just so the online people get to hear as well. Thank you so Sorry. much. Really appreciate for the presentation. The name is Farsh as far as far. I am a, a scientist in the NCD department in WHO headquarter. And uh, I saw that uh, we repeated the, the word of the user a thousand times. And uh, uh, I think it is important to consider this, this, this is a heterogeneous word, is not a homogeneous word. It could be a nurse, it could be a physician, it could be also policymakers, it could be uh, authorities in the local level. So when it is uh, the case, there are possibilities that the interests of the users would uh, somehow conflict to each other. And I wanted to uh, you know, get your opinion how you are dealing with this type of, for example, people who are working at the facility, they like uh, less data, but people who are working at the national level, they like more data. And uh, how we are making this balance between the users when we are going to decide about the shape of design. Thank you. Take that. Uh, I'm Joe, the designer for DHS2. And I mean, that is one of the big problems designing for DHS2 is that uh, overlap of users with different needs. <laughs> the best way we can, <laughs> the best way we can attempt to do it is we, provide sensible defaults for each user type that we know about, but then we also provide the tools for users to configure for experiences we don't know about. So if we attempt to second guess, kind of like what Enzo was saying, what a policymaker needs, we we can get halfway there, but then their needs might evolve over time and the needs of the nurse might evolve over time. So I suppose what we try to do in the interfaces is capacity building in a way, capacity to customize your own experience. And that's kind of where we're, I feel we're taking the apps more and more now is we have that solid generic experience, but then the tools within the apps themselves to make locally relevant uh, apps and experiences. But that's a lofty goal and that's the ambition. But uh, yeah. Maybe I'm gonna add something. Uh, I think this is also a case of, imp of implementation. Are you getting all the users in the same room? Are you having these conversations? Are you communicating? This is important. Do the end users know, do the per people who are putting the data into the system know why it's important? Is each data element, the way you're configuring your program, is that meaningful to the user? And if it's not, why isn't it? So kind of questioning, having this time to design with all the stakeholders and that stakeholder includes the user. Having that opportunity to reframe, okay, is this indicator really useful? Should, this is an opportunity to take time to redesign your indicators so it's meaningful um, at the top to the bottom or getting buy-in. This is important and letting the user know why it's important. Because of this indicator, you get malaria medication. So I think that, uh, from my point of view of design, that's uh, something.
Thank you. Um, yeah, I have two questions actually. Um, the first one is somewhat related, um, uh, and it's in terms of these sort of processes. If people want to apply this, what's what sort of sample sizes uh, should we be should people be thinking about in terms of users? You know, is one enough to get good insights, or should you try and get some uh, some variation and some good sample sizes? Um, and I'll just throw in my second question is, to what extent do you think there's value in other types of tools where you do this kind of user testing by proxy and you kind of track, you know, clicks and things like this, this these kind of tools that might be easier to do without effort, but in gain analysis and, and so on? I can take that. This is working. Yeah. Um about sample sizes, right? Um, so there's this really interesting website and some of you can maybe look up, uh, it's called the Nielsen Norman Group. Uh, they're kind of like the pioneers of user experience. They've been around for a very long time and they've done enough and more research to kind of suggest that being able to test with five users will be able to give you 80% of uh, the usability issues that might crop up in uh, at least one out of three participants. So. It's okay to be able to test with five people, but the five people have to be of one particular uh, persona profile, right? So if I, I want to basically maybe test and see if, uh, you know, like if this can be used by DHIS2 users as well as non-DHIS2 users, I would want to then test with five of each uh, and not like a mix of that, ideally, right? Uh, Again, like there are always going to be barriers. What's what? What if you're not able to reach out to say ten people, right? Five of each. I think it's okay to be flexible. Uh, a lot of times, uh, the kind of usability issues that you see very early on are going to be the large ones. For example, when we were doing the gorilla tests, these were not even users of DHIS two, but we were able to spot very critical uh, design issues that we may have then encountered in Sri Lanka. But because we got it kind of out of the way initially itself with five users, uh, we were then able to get to the meatier stuff rather than just being having to like focus on like, you know, larger uh, problems that could have been solved just by a prototype. Um, what was your next question? <laughs> oh, yeah. What, what are some other maybe techniques that you could be using, right? So usability testing is fairly, um, it's fairly flexible in itself. Right, but uh, I personally prefer a hybrid approach, right? So I uh, mix up methodologies. So that might mean like doing interviews along with this. Uh, you might, if you're trying to work remotely, doing some sort of diary studies could be helpful, right? So you give uh, dedicated people who are kind of willing to do this, right? And uh, giving them an honorium uh, of sorts initially, it's very useful so that you have their commitment, but then being able to kind of give them certain tasks, very simple tasks to be able to do every day and kind of like journaling it in some ways. Uh, that could be a easy, uh, low hanging fruit. Uh, yeah. About, about, about the, um, uh, right, right. Right. Right, right, right. Uh, so the question's more about like whether you should be using some of these, like eye tracking devices, et cetera, or? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think your answer is, is fine, mm. but uh, yeah, it was specifically about uh, yeah. yeah these things that are kind of more passive. You don't really yeah. do anything. You kind of gather analytics, right? right. You build some sort of yeah. usability yeah. analytics. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think analytics is super valuable, right? And that's, uh, I mean, it has to be a mixed approach of quantitative as well as qualitative data because quantitative data helps us understand what is happening. Right, which qualitative data may not be able to capture very well because we are talking to smaller groups of people, right? But qualitative data or like speaking to people directly will be able to help us understand the why behind the problems, right? So we we can see from analytics maybe that people didn't click somewhere, but why did they do that? What was their thought process behind that? These are certain answers that you will be able to get from the qualitative method. So a, a mix of the two would be uh, great and ideal. With these ten people, do you have a, a, a device that you use for the click, follow the hmm. finger so, touch? <laughs> awesome. So, are there uh, are there you mean like websites and like things already out there? There are so many. There are so many tools. I think if you do a simple UX research. 
tools and websites you're going to come across like so many you'll be spoiled for choices my advice though especially if you're starting off all together is to keep it extremely simple right use tools that you are familiar with to begin with right because again here it's it's the same thing that we want to avoid which is that tech shouldn't get into the way of getting good feedback so if you're comfortable with zoom uh, it would be great that you could use something like that. If you are able to meet them in person, that would be the next best thing to, I mean, that would actually be the best thing to do. Uh, there are, I mean, and I can give you some examples. There is uh, there is this website called Look Back. There are uh, Loop Panel. There are lots of them. Uh, use in Sri Lanka. Uh, we were using a Loop Panel. It's uh, Indian. So yes, I was trying to support Panel, Indian. Protopi, yeah. Yeah. So Protopie and Figma are great tools for prototype, uh, for prototyping. Um, some of them require more effort and some require lesser effort. And we kind of saw that when we were on field. Protopie is this really cool tool that allows you to create very realistic uh, scenarios so that like, let's say if you want to see how somebody is searching for someone, it will pop up a keypad, they will be able to enter stuff. And that's all of that is great, but it requires a little bit more effort. So if it's more of a high effort study, you can use something like that. But again, what would be the simplest way to do it? Taking screenshots, right? Taking screenshots, taking printers, uh, printouts, and maybe even giving them like paper prototypes. You could even draw things out, right? So there are very, very low fidelity ways of doing it also um, as well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first of all, great presentation. Really learned a lot. Excellent session. I just wanted to know that we have been discussing, you guys presented the case of Sri Lanka and how that whole process went and the questions that we were seeing on Mandy as well. Do you guys have already tested questionnaires? Maybe we could find them on the community forum somewhere. Tested questionnaires for specifically for DHIS2 and if they had proven in results or any guidebooks on, let's say, if you're doing any FGDs, focus group discussions, if you could just follow them and that could help out a lot of us in, you know, conducting usability tests and gain from all your experiences. So if you are able to come to our expert lounge, <laughs> um, we have uh, created a, a toolkit, basically, essentially a Google Drive link which has some very basic templates that you can use right uh, one of them is going to be uh, an a sample uh, questionnaire for conducting interviews so you'll be able to see what um, icebreaker questions should essentially look like right if you are doing certain tasks what they could potentially look like these are all samples and you can uh, switch them and make it uh, more uh, relevant for yourself um, we are also planning to include another Excel sheet, which was very similar to this, so that you are able to kind of uh, maybe create notes in that. So there are three steps to like any kind of usability tests or research or interviews or any of that. There's there's a part where you're preparing for it and then you're conducting it and eventually you're analyzing it. Actually, there's a fourth part as well, which is then being able to take the recommendations that you are giving and feeding it back into the data that's uh, into the design that's the most important actually so we have uh, a template that allows you to be able to communicate that to your team in uh, in a crisp concise manner because uh, honestly speaking not everybody goes through these reports and that's also because they're tedious nobody has the time so it's got to be uh, small and concise uh, so we do have it. Uh, yeah, long answer short. So and if you uh, want to send us an email to yeah. what is it? Uh, design at dhis two dot org. <laughs> we can't believe it wasn't taken. Yeah, yeah you, you can just send us an email, and we can send you the packet. And hopefully, we'll also have um, uh, send out something on the community. Oh, yeah, we have one minute left. Are there any other questions? Yeah, there's pl plenty, but I'm just thinking of time. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Anake from Burundi, head of HMIS. Uh, I have been very interested by uh, exciting uh, presentation about usability, DHS2. So every time we manage a problem with our users, uh, they ask how to manage, how to do this in DHS2. So I want to ask if uh, there is a possibility to have a, a solution about uh, DHS to you, the user manual, if we can have a link uh, 
for someone who ask and you give him one it's the it's the alarm just one second yeah, yeah they're, they're doing usability testing right now <laughs> yeah yeah okay. just one yeah. sorry you didn't finish uh yeah just if you want to I, I want I was going to finish. I want that uh, if those uh, tools exist, yeah. it will be it is good. <laughs> if not, uh, maybe I ask it to uh, DHS to team also mm -hmm. to develop it. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's a great suggestion. And I think, uh, um, I mean, through our cross product meetings and other things, we've been getting a sense of what exactly is it that uh, the users of DHIS2 and uh, require and uh, you suggested a manual or uh, a method to be able to kind of document this. Yeah, I think we can think about that. And I think it's important to then realize what is the real need, right? The need is then to be able to train. So um, I'm going to give this a thought, right? If man uh, manuals are the best way to do this, or maybe there might be something even more effective. But thank you so much for the suggestion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> also but last last question so people okay so thank you so much for for the great presentation and the session today uh so my loud thoughts and uh, my question may not be relevant directly relevant to the this dhis2 but to my curiosity i just need to ask this that whenever you get to have a like complex requirement from the user for the software development or the app development and whatever the approach which you follow let's say what fall cycle which is happening in the software development how much do you see a well-balanced approach for instance like you know aesthetically well-designed application to the core user functionalities which you have to make so how do you see that and how do you focus on which thing to be done first all right i don't want to speak for others but uh for myself at least uh uh, again, there is this quote I remember, like, make make what's important and make what's truly functional. But um, if you can make it really beautiful, that would be great, right? And this is not me, I'm quoting something else entirely, right? But I think, uh, personally, I think function over form, especially in things like this, right? But it kind of matters and depends on the context always, right? If the purpose of an application or a website is to delight, Right. Uh, and that could be the case with, let's say, video games. Uh, it could be the case with, um, you know, like mental health stress busters and things like that. Uh, it's, again, something that's coming up in like financial technology so that uh, it doesn't feel like such a difficult thing anymore. So people are trying to add those elements of delight and things like that. So their aesthetics matter a lot. Right. Here, however, functionality kind of trumps all of that. Right. A a user should be able to complete their task as expected without doing um, any errors. So here, I would then prioritize this. Uh, so, yeah, okay. Yeah, I think uh, we can close it and maybe you can. Okay. Yeah, again, I'll, we'll let you all go to lunch. Thanks for being here. It was such a great meetup. We're very happy to see you all. So we'll stick around for a bit if someone wants to